Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second day of our inaugural Blood Advocacy Week. Blood Advocacy Week is an opportunity for a variety of people and organizations to come together in support of a safe and available blood supply. And we're so pleased that you're all here today for that event. Today's event will discuss some of the recent changes to who can and likely will be able to in the near future donate blood and the challenges in reaching people impacted to give them the opportunity to serve their community through blood donation. This virtual event is being recorded for future playback and throughout the event, you can enter any questions you have into the Q&A box and those will be presented to the speakers during the Q&A time during, at the end of our presentation. The recording will be available on the Blood Advocacy website after this call. I am now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Ali Van Dyke, who is Strategic Partnerships and Program Manager at the Blood Connection a community blood center which serves donors and patients in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Allie? Thank you so much, Diane. Let me share my screen here and get this up. Okay, I trust that you will let me know if you cannot see anything that I'm saying. So hello everyone. Uh, like she said, my name is Allie, Partnerships and Programs Manager at The Blood Connection. We serve the Carolinas and Georgia. Ooh, come on. Of course you test it and then there we go. Okay, so because this inf information is relevant to our discussion today, I wanna let everyone know that I was Born in Germany, lived in London for a few years before I moved to the States. And because of that, until about a year ago, I was permanently deferred. So we all know this, unfortunately, not everyone can donate blood. We all wish everyone could, but about 62% of Americans are eligible to donate in any given year. So some reasons for not being able to donate are short term, such as taking medication or being pregnant, but others are long term or permanent. I was told that I was permanently deferred in college when I tried to donate for the first time. So the FDA has recently made some changes and proposed others for some of these longer term deferrals that may make millions of Americans newly eligible to donate blood. And these changes are based on new data and evidence-based decision-making. So today we're gonna talk about two of these changes. The one that affects me, which is the restrictions on donations by those that spent time in the UK and Europe because of concerns over mad cow disease, and then proposed changes to eliminate time-based deferrals for gay and bisexual men in favor of individual donor assessment of all donors. So like I said, the mad cow topic is personal to me. I was quite upset after hearing I was permanently deferred. So I really am so happy that I can donate now. And it turns out there are a lot, there are a lot of people in my community who feel the same way. So for us, I just wanna recap the changes that we've been through here in April, 2020 seems like such a long time ago. Now this change that eliminated this deferral, it was a great thing, but it didn't get much attention. Of course, um, we at the Blood Connection, we did all that we could to get the word out, but COVID was certainly the headline and we didn't have a lot of people asking about it either. So then fast forward to last year, um, it was a lot more impactful. Strategy had to be made to handle permanent deferrals. So the people who knew they couldn't donate and have already tried. And so here are some things that we did at the Blood Connection to get the word out to those permanently deferred donors in our system who we could contact. We really, really wanted to avoid donors showing up to a center or blood mobile and figuring out that they still couldn't donate. Now, since I worked at the Blood Connection, I knew, I knew who, how all of that worked, but there were a lot of people who did not. So just to give you a glimpse into what we were dealing with here at the Blood Connection, this is a really, really small percentage of our donor base. Demographic with the most donors um, in this eligibility window was uh, females between 51 and 90, which is not too surprising for us. And I think it's important to note that our theory is that many younger donors like me, we haven't even tried to donate because we know that we can't give already because somebody has told us that along the way, almost like having a tattoo. And that's why they're not in our system. So we are really limited here, especially with the contact information that we did not have, which was very outdated. So just getting some feedback from our TBC response teams here. And although it was, it was necessary to do this, it wasn't super successful to just reach out to those permanently deferred donors. We knew because of this that we needed to focus more on self-deferred donors and our staff and making sure they knew what to tell donors so the word could spread about this change. As you can see, 182 donors 
Yeah, and that's 23% of the ones that we could reinstate. That is a tiny, tiny amount. So, you know, every donation counts, of course, we're all saying that to each other, but this is not a huge impact, not a big splash. So we really shifted the energy here to um, the key part of this process, which was engaging our employees. And because of the the change had happened months before we were able to implement it because of everything that happened with DIHQ. So we needed everyone on the same page and we sent a what we call a keeping you informed, which is clear details and likely questions from donors that our staff would would deal with. And so we've seen it happen on drives time and time again, that if the donor services staff, they feel confident about the information, they will share it. And our leadership was very engaged in making sure that donor facing staff knew about these changes as well. And this is the keeping you informed document, one of our longer ones, and I write these, so this one was pretty challenging, but just the frequently asked questions is certainly what took up the, the most of this. All right, so moving on to our media outreach, we really wanted this to be a big splash and I, and I wish it was, but it really wasn't. Um, you know, we were trying to make a splash with the headline there and this is mid July, which is, it's good timing because we were already doing critical need at this point because it was the summer. We had a pretty strong open rate in terms of um, media in general and, and quite a few mentions. I mean, this is something to be proud of for sure, but we certainly wanted more media to latch on this because it was a very, very big deal to us, but it was very hard to just reach everyone so that people would tell their friends, their family who knew that they were ineligible for this reason to go now and donate blood. So again, the reinstatement process was important, but the real focus was how to engage people who have been self deferred. And me and my family and a couple of my neighbors actually are that are in this boat. So I know plenty of people who come up to me at a registration at a drive and ask about living in Europe, and they're kind of expected to be turned away and they were turned away about a year ago. Um, we thought about where these people may be together so we could target specific groups for blood drives more efficiently instead of just blanket messaging the community because you can only do that so long. And so there are many places that we serve here in the South now that are turning into soccer towns, which as a half British person, I'm very happy to see that. Um, so we have an example here in Greenville, South Carolina. He was um, the head soccer coach here and he was deferred at the team's last blood drive because of his time spent in England and he is now able to donate and that's that's him. So because of the craziness of COVID, VA hospitals, VFWs, military bases, they weren't properly targeted the first time the FDA made those changes. So there's a lot more effort to let blood drive coordinators at those places know and our recruitment departments had special messaging this time. So it wasn't just a side note when it came to booking those blood drives and going more frequently as well. So I think we're all wondering, and we were too here at the Blood Connection, of course, did that make any impact? So as many of you are experiencing, it has been a struggle to collect and make goal on blood drives, but there was a little glimmer of light in our stats here when it comes to the drives that we targeted with that messaging. 2021, total of 17 drives at these organizations that I listed, and we had 16 booked just in 49 days right after the rollout of this, which was um, right at the end of July. So that's really great, and that has been consistent. We've been getting them back on the calendar, which is great. So I'm happy to say that there was some impact, and we, we armed our recruitment um, personnel with information like this handout here, making sure that it stays top of mind. So lastly, now our focus is keeping the message out there. It's a message we share on social media often. We, and even better than that, people are sharing their experiences with us. As you saw in the very beginning slide, I was kind of the poster child for the blood connection um, in terms of being now eligible and being an employee here. We received these two testimonials in the first couple of weeks. The people who are coming back to us are very enthusiastic. It's like they've been waiting for this day. So our hope is that with the help of Advocacy Day, other efforts, Advocacy Week, I should say, um, webinars like this, other efforts, more people with a platform will get behind this initiative to widen the donor pool, because I know that's what we, we all need. Okay, so now it is, let me stop sharing before I do that. There we go. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Marks. 
Thanks very much. I'm just going to get up my uh, screen to share here. Uh, thanks. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to see. And now I hope you're actually seeing my full screen here. So I'll take you through kind of the developments that we've had on the blood donor side on uh, reducing HIV risk. Um, just to uh, remind everyone, uh, you know, to reduce the risk of HIV until 2015, we had an indefinite deferral in place uh, for men who had sex with men uh, to try to reduce the risk of HIV in the blood supply. Uh, that was changed in 2015 to a 12-month uh, deferral. And then in 2020, uh, based on data that came from our transfusion transmitted uh, infection monitoring system, we moved that down to three months because there did not seem to be any issue um, with uh, any change in safety uh, in the blood supply going from indefinite uh, to 12 months. So uh, the current status is we have a three month deferral. And uh, where we are right now um, is that um, data uh, on uh, uh, continued safety of the blood supply following uh, the three-month deferral uh, move uh, show that uh, there's no difference. And, and if anything, um, uh, the safety is just as nice now, uh, as uh, just as good now as it was um, when we moved from, uh, to, to, from indefinite to 12 months. So uh, we're feeling uh, that there's good data supporting further progression of the policies. We now have data uh, from the United Kingdom and Canada uh, where there were moves to individual risk assessments. Those populations are similar to ours in terms of uh, the uh, HIV epidemiology. So we're feeling uh, that's helpful. Um, and then uh, you're going to hear more about, I'm sure, the uh, advanced study, but I'll just say that um, those data combined with the data from the advanced uh, study that was uh, sponsored by FDA, but really conducted through community partnerships um, uh, has really helped us feel uh, comfortable moving forward. Um, uh, the advanced study was put together. Uh, actually, it was conceived um, uh, about seven, six, seven years ago um, uh, as a study uh, to try to help uh, us understand whether individual risk assessment questions uh, could help us uh, distinguish a group of active men who are having sex with men who could donate uh, without a deferral period. Um, and it was uh, ended up being uh, conducted through a partnership uh, where a number of blood collectors worked then with um, advocacy organizations um, uh, and community health centers uh, to enroll people during an incredibly challenging time of the pandemic, mostly, um, uh, in, uh, in order to uh, get the data that we needed. Um, it was conducted in eight places across the country where HIV rates are still reasonably high in terms of new uh, infections um, uh, due to the transmission dynamics. Um, and uh, all of these uh, places, the blood centers worked uh, and the community organizations worked really tirelessly to get people in uh, to enroll. Um, it was a pretty simple study, uh, an eligibility assessment, uh, 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 and then consent to participate for a blood sample collection, and then a possible um, uh, interview um, regarding uh, behaviors. Um, and people were, were then called back uh, to get their test results uh, uh, and uh, uh, the follow-up interviews uh, for those who elected to participate. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we originally wanted to try to get to 2,000, um, uh, but we got up to uh, 1,788 uh, eligibility visits, pretty close. And from uh, at what we determined, that uh, was close enough. Um, uh, uh, and it was pretty remarkable getting there, given all of the headwind uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, 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 1,566 blood draws, which was 78% of our goal. Um, importantly, um, uh, originally we were only going to have about 200, 250 interviews uh, done, and uh, ultimately we expanded that. So we have a very rich set of 1,200 individuals who consented to be uh, interviewed. So a lot of data 
uh, to pile through. I'm just going to give you a very uh, uh, a very uh, quick taste of the data that was helpful to us. Um, one of the pieces of information that came from this is just kind of a, a, a check uh, on whether uh, there would be people moving from a, uh, uh, a three-month deferral uh, to no deferral who could actually donate um, uh, because they might meet some criteria, um, such as having only had one uh, partner in the past three months. Uh, and uh, indeed, you can see here that uh, if you look, people who were not taking PrEP, um, the majority of them had only one partner in the past three months. It's true that those who were taking PrEP tended to have more partners, but that actually was also a check on things that said that, hey, people were taking PrEP for the right reasons because um, uh, people who were taking PrEP generally had more than one partner, if not multiple partners. So th this is just a smattering of the data. There's a lot more richness there, but I'm not going to go into it because what I want to spend is a couple minutes telling you about where we've come uh, into the uh, draft guidance and where we're headed. Um, so um, really, uh, the, uh, the advanced study is now pre-published online. Um, uh, and uh, so you can see uh, the, the manuscript that's been put together. Um, we, it, based on all of those data that I have described, uh, we put together a uh, guidance uh, that we issued in uh, draft guidance that was issued in uh, uh, 2023, beginning of it in January. Um, uh, this draft uh, has been through a, a comment period now. I'll tell you more about that. Um, the, the draft basically is looking at individual risk assessment uh, rather than a fixed time uh, deferral. Um, the deferral algorithm that we do have, though, um, uh, obviously we will defer individuals who have, HI, have a history of HIV infection uh, or people who are taking medications for HIV infection. I think that probably is, goes, is, is self-explanatory. Um, at this point in time, uh, something that is slightly controversial, but is we don't have any way around right now, is that um, uh, based on the data we have in hand that shows that uh, PrEP can uh, decrease the ability of nucleic acid tests to detect HIV infection, um, we uh, have a three-month deferral for uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis use. We'll continue to look at this over the coming uh, uh, months and years and see if we can change this, at, particularly as we get uh, uh, more data in from studies. Um, the deferral for injectable PrEP is longer um, uh, because of the long half-life. And then the uh, essentially the working part of this guidance um, uh, is that uh, is that we have a three-month deferral um, for most recent sexual contact for people who have had um, more than one sexual partner or, uh, inter or uh, a new sexual partner in the past three months. This is consistent uh, with uh, what is being done now in the United Kingdom and in, uh, uh, and in Canada. Um, and in the guidance, uh, we it will be clear what we mean by uh, a new sexual partner. Um, uh, the comment period for this guidance closed at the end of March. Um, uh, there were a, a rich number of comments. Um, uh, I believe uh, somewhere uh, around 200 uh, or, or so, um, uh, about uh, a third of those from industry and the remainder from uh, uh, private individuals. Um, and we've now uh, gone through and addressed those. Um, uh, our goal will be to uh, issue a final version of this guidance in the pretty near future. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll be to uh, endorse an updated donor history questionnaire very shortly thereafter. So um, we're looking forward to um, uh, working with the community to uh, get this implemented. Uh, I think this will be um, uh, a, a pretty big deal for us because it really has uh, shown that in the past, in about seven years, we've moved uh, quite a ways. So I'll stop there and I'll look forward to questions later on. Great, thank you, Dr. Marks. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think it's my turn. My name is Benjamin Brooks. I'm gonna share my slides. Hopefully everyone can see those shortly. Give me some sign if they popped up. 
It's trying to. There it goes. There Here we go. <laughs> Challenging internet today. Hello, everyone. My name is Benjamin Brooks, and I use he him pronouns. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Education with the Whitmarker Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm really honored to be here. This is a really important moment. Um, we at Whitman Walker have advocated to expand uh, the potential pool of eligible donors for a really long time. Um, and we think that this particular instance around it, expanding to allow gay, bisexual, and same gender loving men really is uh, emblematic of the kind of way that we think science can lead us into a more equitable future. So um, I'm going to get started on some of this, uh, what I have prepared for you today. Um, it's, it's, I want to share with you our mission and our vision at Whitman Walker, because I think it, it reflects for you how um, we are going to try to see that we walk this out. Um, we envision a society where everyone is seen for who they are, treated with dignity and respect, and afforded equal opportunity to help and well-being. Um, we were founded 50 years ago in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and part of what we've done since then as a place where people routinely go for their sexual health care from 1973 onward, it, it, it is a place that people can uh, get their care safely. So during the, the 80s and 90s, Whitman Walker expanded rapidly to respond to the HIV epidemic. Um, but what I want to sort of emphasize for you here is that what you're seeing in terms of my face is just one fruit of a, of a very large tree of a huge family of over 300 folks who are working together to achieve that kind of care for all of our patients here in Washington, D.C. Um, and of course, uh, Virginia, Maryland, and many of the surrounding st states. Um, of course, 40 years ago in 1983, the, the, the FDA first uh, began their blood donation deferral pol policy, excuse me, I have a stutter, uh, for men who have sex with men. This was done to uh, protect, right, the safety and security of the blood supply. We don't want to go back to, to those horrifying days of, of, of folks contracting H. IV while they're trying to receive life-saving medical care. And we're thrilled because oh, we, we've experienced 40 years of advancements in the science of HIV screening technology, but also, as Dr. Marx alluded to, our ability to understand the kinds of questions that we can ask of donors, the kinds of information that can be reliably and routinely gathered from everyone to ensure that the pool of potential donors is as large as it can be, and that we continue to preserve the safety and security of the blood supply. So while, while I also want to shout out and raise up the researchers, scientists, and medical providers who paved the way for this update, I recognize as a, as a person who works in, in LGBTQ cultural competency and advocates for HIV care, that it is the tireless work of LGBTQ people everywhere and people living with HIV to, to, de to destigmatize LGBTQ ident ident identities and to ensure that science leads the way and not, not stigma. Um, so we're really honored to be a part of the advanced study. Whitman Walker was a key recruitment partner uh, with the advanced study. We created these images that you see on the screen in, in front of you. I've thrown them up because I think that they also represent for us part of the challenge as we move forward here. Um, you'll notice that these images uh, were designed for one population and used in outreach across the United States. I think this is a, a fine way that we often live where we don't have the time or the resources to create materials that are tailor-made for each community. And so we do the best we can and we, we don't reinvent the wheel, we use what's out there. 
But for us, we recognize in our recruitment activities that while this image worked well to recruit folks in the DMV, the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area, uh, where we were able to recruit, you know, routinely, I believe the last time um, about a third of the study participants were re recruited uh, in the DMV area. And what we, when we uh, went to support re re recruitment at other sites um, across the, the country, these images didn't work. These messages weren't reaching folks in in those other places. And the recruitment numbers weren't going up as high as we would have liked. And so what we note here is, is, is that local images, local faces, local voices, local messages are essential. We cannot, um, as we move forward, we, we cannot use a one size fits all approach. It is essential that blood donation centers that are inviting L members of the LGBT community back and more, spe more specifically, right, gay, bisexual, and same gender loving men back, that you have to be looking to partner closely with your local org, org organizations. Um, we so, so, sort of note here um, that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. We note here that um, recruitment is really more about relationship building. So don't wait until Pride Month to reach us. Build those relationships now. June is our busiest time. And so reaching out in, in March, April, and May is essential to make sure that you can get that spot at that Pride Parade. Make sure that that you're present at, at, the, fest, at the Pride Festival. Um, make sure that you're present not just at the main pride, but find out where your AAPI prides are taking place. Where is uh, Latinx pride happening? Where is Black pride ha ha happening? Make sure that you're aware of the multi multiple facets of the LGBTQ community. We are uh, not a uh, monolith and um, it is going to take a, a, a little bit of effort and time to reach out to us. Um, so I'm going to advance to my next slide here, but I want to note that there are many local partners waiting for you. You can find them through your local PFLAG chapters. You can find them through your local HRC affiliates. You can find a, a huge list of your local LGBTQ health uh, sorry, LGBTQ community centers through centerlink.org. So waiting for you in your community are folks who are ready and willing to partner with you. I want to share, importantly, a couple of extra notes here. Um, this is the newly proposed approach that doesn't ask people about, uh, or that doesn't only ask men about their sexual partners, is incredibly important advancement for uh, for addressing the changing face of the HIV epidemic. As this slide shows, heterosexual contact accounts for 22% of new HIV diagnosed, diagnoses. And so it's clear that if we want to end the HIV epidemic, we have to be mindful of perpetuating old stigmatizing messages HIV is not a gay disease. HIV does not discriminate, doesn't care. Uh, and so what we need to be educating everyone on is that everyone is potentially at risk for HIV. Everyone needs to, to get tested for HIV. And that the most important thing that we can do to end the HIV epidemic is know your status. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that we, we, we see that this change is really making the blood supply safer for everyone by ensuring that we're not relying on outdated stereotypes. I'm gonna keep moving and talk about what's next. So we are seeing the FDA's uh, proposed changes and we are expecting new uh, final guidance from them shortly, but when can we donate? So 
keep in mind, as was really alluded to earlier by Abby, we don't want to let, sorry, Allie, we don't want to let folks come to the blood center and have that really disappointing experience of being turned away. So keep communicating the timeline uh, so that we know when we are welcome to come back and donate. Like I said early, reach out now to avoid disappointment. If if the blood center wants to march in the Pride Parade, guess what? Registration for the Pride Parade ends this Saturday in Washington, D.C. So you've got to get on it now if you want to build those relationships. The third point here is make it local, right? There are individual histories and heroes of your own LGBT community in your cities and states. So find those folks who hold that history and invest the time and energy to learn from them on how to heal this divide that has really built up over, over, over the 40 years of uh, LGBTQ people being deferred. And then finally here, we don't know what messages will work for your community, but I'm really, um, throughout this, this conversation, my mind all often goes back to the Pulse nightclub shooting and the images of, of gay and bisexual men going to their hospitals and, and their clinics to try to find a way to help their community and being turned away. And so we we know that our community needs us and, and we deserve the right and the privilege to be full contributing members of our communities. And so I think this is a very motivating message. Um, and we know that the blood that is donated in our communities supports our communities. And, and so we as, as queer people may need a little bit of education from blood centers. Uh, but but it'll be worth it um, because we know that you need us um, and we are here to help. That's it for me. I'm glad to turn it back over. Uh, next up, we have Cody Keckler, I believe. Yep. Thank you, Benjamin. Next up, we have Cody Keckler from Representative Mike Quickly's office. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cody. Um, I'm a legislative assistant for Congressman Mike Quigley. Um, he is the representative for the Illinois 5th District. Um, he uh, wanted to address everyone himself, but unfortunately was not able to make it. So I've been sent in his place. Um, so my apologies to you all. Um, along that same message, I, I don't have any slides prepared. So uh, no great images like the other presenters. Uh, but all that said, uh, happy Blood Advocacy Week um, and welcome to Capitol Hill. Um, the Congressman would like to first extend his appreciation to you all um, for your advocacy uh, in your work to um, expand access to blood donation um, and especially for the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and thank you to the other panelists as well for all of your work uh, on this important topic. Um, this is something uh, that the Congressman has worked on since he got to Congress, um, so back in 2009. Um, and over the years, one event that uh, made this policy particularly notable, as Benjamin mentioned, was Pulse, uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting, um, when members of the community were not able to donate blood uh, to others who needed it. Um, and so uh, these updates that Director Mark Marks walked us through just a few minutes ago um, are very welcome um, and are something that the Congressman has been looking forward to. Um, and we're excited about the positive impacts that will follow um, this updated guidance. Um, so back in 2009, during his first term, Congressman Quigley uh, was a leading voice in Congress to end this blood donation ban. Um, and since then, he's supported all sorts of resolutions. Um, he's written letters to the FDA, um, all on the topic of uh, facing our blood donation policies in science. Um, and so, uh, we were already excited when the FDA's advanced study was announced. Um, this was before I joined the office, so I actually um, was a participant in the advanced study myself. Um, and so uh, we're really excited about the ability to base this policy in science and to have uh, that real world data um, to back it up. Um, and so this uh, recent announcement by the FDA is our biggest step forward. Um, as we just heard, the updated updated donation guidelines 
um, will end the ban on men who have sex with men from donating blood. Um, instead, it asks all donors to undergo an individual risk-based assessment. Um, and so while there are still some restrictions, such as on people taking PrEP, um, this is definitely progress that we are proud of. Um, and Congressman does extend his thanks to the FDA uh, for this policy. Um, that said, uh, next steps. Um, so in particular, uh, there's going to need to be a concerted effort to bring in the folks who weren't able to give blood um, and to make everyone feel welcome in the community. Um, and so as a member of the Appropriations Committee, the Congressman uh, has supported funding to help educate newly eligible donors um, about this change in policy. Um, Congress will uh, be making important decisions about funding over the next couple of months. Um, and so uh, as members of the committee here in the House, um, we are working to ensure that funding is provided for this purpose. Um, because after so many years where folks were not able to participate in blood donations, um, it's going to be really important that we are intentional uh, in communicating all the changes that were discussed today. Um, in particular, some of the restrictions might be difficult to explain, um, and we want to be uh, really mindful that the changes in policy are implemented and explained in a way that does not stigmatize the community. Um, and by being intentional while educating folks, uh, we do believe that we can start to close that rift between blood donation centers and the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and so, uh, again, thank you, Benjamin, um, for your notes about partnering with local organizations and communities and building those relationships uh, because that's going to be so, so important going forward. Um, there's definitely a lot of work left to be done, uh, but by no way are we giving up. Um, we're really just looking forward um, to the next steps uh, in this policy. Um, so thank you all for all of your ongoing advocacy. Um, and I'm going to yield back my time. All right, Diane, you seem ready, so take it away. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Cody and your boss for all your fantastic efforts in supporting blood centers and really in helping to move this policy forward and helping to get that local messaging that as Benjamin talked about is so essential. I'm just gonna pull up my slides here. All right, um, so as was mentioned, as Dr. Marks went through, we have seen these deferral changes. We are anticipating um, the additional change for the LGBTQ community to be moving forward. And now is the time where that hard work starts as our, as our panelists have talked about. The process of welcoming these donors back or bringing them in for the first time um, it's not a simple one, you know, as Allie mentioned with those VCJD donors that were deferred for um, kind of where they were at various times in history, um, they're oftentimes unaware of the change and because they had been told either formally by going into a blood center and trying to donate or by somebody else who had a similar situation to theirs that they were permanently deferred, they're largely not listening for messaging to tell them something different. And so they're a very challenging group to reach. Um, additionally, a lot of those impacted with that change are either veterans, military or military families. Um, and they oftentimes are very transient in their various communities. So they have, may have lived multiple places uh, where they were deferred may have initially been deferred in one location. And so that local blood center wouldn't have that connection for them. Obviously, as a result of the history that Benjamin laid out so well related to HIV and AIDS crisis, what was historically a very strong group of blood donors, the gay and bisexual community, this was something, um, if you look historically, they were always very strong blood donors. Um, it's now part of that process to bring those donors back and let them know that they are an important part of this community in donating blood. Um, ABC has partnered with a number of organizations in the LGBTQ space to make sure that on the national level, we're bringing together these groups. 
um, and working together on strong messaging as well as, as Benjamin alluded to, uh, connecting our local blood centers with their local community organizations in order to make those connections. All of these are an essential piece of this so that we can amplify the message about these changes to actually reach these groups. But it is a challenge. It is going to be hard work on the part of all of our blood centers to really invite these people back and let them know that they're such an important part of the community that is donating blood. What we really need though is local messaging. So obviously national messaging is great, can be helpful in generally bringing some education but what we've seen is that it's that really local messaging that matters. Um, and we've seen this in the blood industry where we worked with the collection of convalescent plasma. And when we were able to help and through the government with some funding, get that funding right to the local community blood centers, they were able to increase the number of collections of that life-saving product that was used during COVID-19 by 244% in a very short amount of time. So a huge change that we've been able to see. And I think particularly as we're looking at these changes, reaching out to gay and bisexual men to let them know about this, it's especially important that that local messaging is what we're working for. Um, as Benjamin talked about, they created these amazing assets, those great products that really brought people in in the in the DC area, but when they were taken into other communities, they didn't resonate in the same sort of way. It's not that they were bad, it was just that local imaging, local language varies from community to community. And so having those resources to reach out to the local community that really are tailored um, to those local communities is so essential in this space. And this really is a place where the local language and the norms, they vary a lot community to community. And so making sure that we are always using that inclusive language that really resonates with that local community, making sure the imagery is correct, um, is so important and is gonna be really important going forward. And this is why we've been working with Congress, including Rep Quigley's office, um, and Cody has been such a great ally um, in working with his boss to really move this forward on that appropriation side to really reach out and make sure that Congress understands the need for this local targeted messaging, that blood centers are doing all that they can to reach out to this community. But this isn't just about recruiting blood donors. It's really about building those relationships with those individuals who have felt disconnected from the blood supply because of the history and being unable to participate. Um, and so we are working very hard to make sure that these communities are again connected. But this work can't be done alone. And that's why you guys are all on this call today. This really is about not just blood centers, they are doing their part, but really growing and diversifying the donor base. And so each one of you can play such an important role. So obviously what you can do is donate blood if you're eligible. Um, when you do become newly eligible, if you're in those categories, um, being that voice that reaches out to others and tells them about the changes um, and lets them know when they can donate blood is obviously a piece of it. But right now, today, what you can do is support advocacy changes um, right on our website. And I know that Jeff has put in the chat here um, a link to a place on our website where you can go and send a letter to your member of Congress that can be personalized. And I want to emphasize the importance of really personalizing this message, letting them know how you have been impacted or people you know and care about have been in impacted by these changes. Um, and why this is so important to really reach that com these communities. Um, additionally, you can help on social media by sharing. We have a number of resources that are also available on the bloodadvocacyweek.org website that you can share on social media to get the message out and really share and help advocate to support the blood supply. Finally, if you're a part of an organization, we are going to, um, in the coming weeks, be sharing partner letters um, that we're going to send to Congress. So even those who are not individual looking to send a letter to their member of Congress will be able to support the effort as well. And we will get be getting those out to all of you who participated in this call. 
So there are a lot of ways you can help and support these efforts. Um, I also do wanna just do a really quick plug for the continuation of blood advocacy. We have another couple of um, events that are free and open to the public coming up. So on Thursday at 2 p.m., we have One Time Matters, Saving and Enhancing Lives Through lives through the Access to Blood. And then on Friday, it's about life, why donor diversity is critical to patient care. So um, with that, I'm going to leave you with this information about, uh, this isn't actually tomorrow, sorry, my mistake. This is actually on Thursday, as I stated there. So um, Thursday's event tomorrow, um, our blood center members will be heading up to Capitol Hill to share this message and really talk about what the changes are that are being made. Um, so now we can open it to questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box that is on the screen. Um, I will start working through some of those questions to our fantastic panelists here. Um, the first question I have is, in the chat is for Cody. Um, and it is about how pleased they are to see what your office is doing to support these changes um, and asking how those who are interested in supporting your efforts on the Hill can really support those changes and, and all that your boss is doing, um, especially to get that funding for local blood centers. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'd say really the most important thing um, in that regard would be to uh, contact your representatives um, and let them know. Um, uh, there's always a ton of things happening here on the Hill. Uh, and in all of these appropriations bills, there's so many different lines. Um, so it really helps uh, us staff when um, people reach out and let us know like what it is that you've heard about or seen that you like really care about um, and make sure that it's on our radar. Um, and so uh, letting people know and then also explaining um, the impact uh, of this policy uh, and uh, just your own perspective on it as well um, is really helpful in informing um, just our understanding. Awesome, thank you so much, Cody. Um, Allie, this next question is for you um, about the changes that impacted those blood donors or potential blood donors that are now able to donate. Um, and talking about the fact that many of these donors were military or veterans or military families. Um, do you know has your blood center or other blood centers started to work with those groups um, to start start reaching out to them and, and how might somebody get involved in, in helping making that message really resonate? Yeah, so there, I mean, that's gonna be the, the easiest place to go. And I'm just bringing up my, um, my stats again. So like I said, that was kind of the main um, area that we focused on in terms of recruitment, because we knew that you can only get so far with finding where British people or Irish people hang out here. That that wasn't really going to work out. I mean, I'm not a military family, so I was one of those outliers, but most people are going to have been from a military family if they now live here. So um, we were not doing a good job with that just in general. And I think probably because we knew it was kind of a lost cause almost with a lot of people getting deferred. But I mean, to have 16 drives booked in 49 days when we only had 17 for the entire year in 2021, um, that means that, that just that simple messaging of, hey, just because you spent time in the UK or Europe, you can donate now, that worked. And I think it's just, it's like when you tell somebody that, that with a tattoo that they can donate, it's like their whole life flashes before their eyes, like how many years have gone by without me knowing that. So we jumped on that really quickly. And I think that was the most helpful. How do we do that? We have um, a system that we use um, here at the Blood Connection Esri, and it can just tell us all these different groups, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, but just all these different groups, if we type in nonprofit, if we type in the word veteran, and it brings up lists, and then we just divided it by our recruitment um, areas and sent it to the directors and let their teams handle it in terms of reaching out specifically. We didn't think it was a great idea to have the first reach out be from our marketing department to then hand it off. 
we thought it would be best if it was the person who was actually going to be working that drive and having that personal relationship as Benjamin was explaining so well. So we are figuring out and the resources that he gave are great to then transfer that to the LGBTQ community as well, because it really was kind of that simple. Um, and I think just the effort being there from there being virtually not a lot of effort in terms of trying to get blood drives out of these organizations to um, just letting them know that they can. And I will say, we have a really big military school in Charleston, the Citadel, and you don't have to really say anything other than donate blood to these kids for them to just come because it's like service is so ingrained in them. And I think that's why it was successful to just simply ask these veterans organizations and everything. Um, the younger the population, the better is what we're finding out. And so um, veterans organizations that are service driven, we have one of those here in the Greenville area. There's a lot more of those popping up because funding is few and far between, it seems like more and more. So that was really helpful. And I, it's just, it was just that grassroots um, just go out in front of them and tell them that they could. And that's why our marketing department was really big into creating materials that they could just leave with people or remind people or sign up right there to, to host a blood drive or just donate at one. Because we were we were thrilled either way if someone was going to come and donate at a center versus booking a blood drive. We just wanted as many people to know. Thanks so much, Allie. So Cody, the next question is again for you. Um, at a time of such extreme partisanship, blood advocacy is an amazing opportunity to bring desperate groups together for community benefit um, and reducing costs by increasing blood availability. How can we initiate more bipartisan support for these efforts from what you see on the Hill? Oh boy, that is the question these days, I would say. Um, but uh, I do really think that starting um, with your story and like being able to share it uh, with folks um, who like may or may not be just naturally inclined to support it um, is a really good place to start. Um, I think uh, it's just like that that personal impact um, is a really good way of like driving past partisan politics and like uh, letting people know um, just like this is real. It affects folks out there um, all across the nation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just reaching out and having conversations with with everyone um, from all political backgrounds and ideologies. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. March, the next question is for you. And being that you guys are in a comment period, your comment will likely be no comment, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. <laughs> um, is there any chance that we're going to see pathogen reduction um, addressed in the guidance at some point in the future, replacing um, looking at individual risk for HIV and or the PrEP deferrals? So, you know, I, I can't speak to the guidance, but I can say that we've, we've been very amenable to uh, pathogen reduction strategies for platelet donation uh, and, and plasma donation. Um, uh, it's just a matter of blood centers uh, putting in the uh, putting these in place uh, to be able to use those methods. This is something we discussed at a uh, blood products advisory committee meeting a couple years ago. Um, so uh, maybe that's something we'll want to uh, take up uh, moving forward again. Thanks so much. Um, the next question is actually for Benjamin. And this is a question about how blood centers and those who want to talk about this change, um, even with friends and family, can really address the appropriate language and, and make sure that they're finding the right way to talk about these groups and um, moving forward to make sure that they really are addressing the needs of, the, of, of their, their local community. Thanks, Diane. So that's a really good question. And I, I know that we can offer what might be considered some general guidance, right? We know there are some ways that we can say, you know, here we can be pretty sure that you're being disrespectful if you're using this language and respectful if you're using this language. Um, those kinds of things, I put in, I put them into a LGBTQ cultural competency bucket, right? How do we make sure that we don't accidentally sort of eat our words or, or put our foot in our mouths, if you will. Um, so I would encourage folks to 
look to uh, us, Whitman Walker. Um, there's a great website that we put up called culturalcompetency.org with a specific sort of tailored bent to uh, healthcare providers and, and social service providers, but the content will be really relevant along this line, especially in the blood donation space. Um, but, and I hate to sound like a broken record, each community is going to be really different. And especially, you know, folks from Georgia are going to need different things than folks in New York. And so we have to be really aware that one size doesn't fit all. Um, and so what, what I really re recommend people do is, is reach out, use your local yellow pages, uh, find those folks who have put themselves out there as well, well welcoming spaces and invite and pay them most importantly, right? Because time is money. And that's really why um, this request for appropriations to support this kind of communications effort is really key because we need more resources to do the kind of education training uh, that are much needed to make sure that we continue to have a safe and secure blood supply into the future. Well, and with that, um, we are coming up at the four o'clock hour, so I want to be really respectful of everyone's time um, and start to wrap up. So thank you so much to first all of our panelists um, for your time. This was such a great discussion, and I look forward to more discussion moving forward as this guidance is finalized um, and as we continue as a blood community to work and do the really hard work now that comes next of implementing this change as well as that BCJD change that Allie so wonderfully talked about. Um, just a reminder, you can reach out to your member of Congress. Um, as I mentioned, Jeff put that link in the chat. Um, and you can also at any time um, go to the Blood Advocacy Week website um, and reach out to your member of Congress. It's very simple. You simply just fill in your information, your, your home address, and it will identify your member of Congress and it will pull up um, a pre-populated letter that you can then personalize and add to with your story. Um, so it's a really simple way that you can make a big difference in reaching out to Congress. If you have any questions about blood advocacy or any of the advocacy actions, you can reach out to Jeff, who is our Director of Strategic Communication and National Partnerships, and he has put his contact information in the chat, and we are happy to work with all of you um, to help you make these efforts to reach out to the Hill. Thank you again for participating in this event, and we really encourage you to visit the Blood Advocacy uh, website and register for other Blood Advocacy Week events and learn easy ways you can support blood advocacy, including through social media. We have graphics that are already ready to go, um, as well as an easy interface, again, to reach out to your member of Congress. So thank you, everyone, for participation. Thank you again to our panelists. You are also fantastic, not just for your work here, but really the work you guys do every day that makes this happen and that really does support our blood supply. So thank you so much and have a great day.